God most high, Jesus Christ, you are El Elohim Israel, Elion, Jesus Christ, you are El Elohim You are 
You are the Lamb who sits upon the throne. There is none like you. You are worthy to receive all the glory. Worthy to receive all the honor. Worthy to receive all the power and praise. For we can search through all eternity and we will still not find a God like you. Who lives with his people. Who works for those who wait on him. Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. In our lives in the earth. Oh, as it is in the heavens. Oh, let your name be lifted up above all the powers in the nations, above all the powers in the heavens and in the earth. Let every knee bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for the place that you have gone for us. Thank you for the victories, 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 victories that you have won for us. Oh, what shall we say to these things? Rebe de lebe kobo simbra da mayana. Ako pele talk. We have come to say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We have come to say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We bring you the glory that is due to you. No one else can take it. No one else can receive it. So here it is, Jesus. We wave our lives. We wave our lives before you. We wave our lives. We pour out our lives as an offering before the great eternal monarch, the one who lives forever. He has no beginning of days. He would have no end of days. For he is existence itself. Come and I know in him we live. In him we move. In him we have our being. Oh Lord our God. How excellent is your name in all the earth. All the angels bow before you. The mountains, they break forth into singing. Before the God of the universe. The Lord is in this temple. Let everyone keep quiet. Let the nations be still. In the presence of the one who gives life and who also can take it. When he makes a life, no one can kill. And when he kills, no one can make a life. The final authority in all of the existences. Very thing. The one, the only, strong and mighty. The almighty God. <laughs> Who can compare to you, my Jesus? Who can contend with you? Who can battle with you? Who can compete with you? Ha ha ha. We worship you, Lord. It is your children. We have come again this morning. To come and say, Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Can you say to him, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Say it again. Say, the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people. The sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gate with thanksgiving in your heart. Enter into his court with praise. Worship him. Give glory to him. 
for he is good and his mercy endures forever. His faithfulness extends to all generations. Thank you, Jesus. What a privilege to have you as our Father. What a honor to have you as a friend. That we can confide in you and you can confide in us. That it pleases you to share your secrets with us. Oh, it pleases you. That we should be called your own. And we can also say you are our God. David said in Psalm chapter number 16, he says, I said to the Lord, you are my master. I said to God, you are my Lord. And who is God if not the Lord? And who is our rock if not God? He is the one who arms us with strength. Teaches our hands to war and our fingers to battle. He makes us sure footed as the deer. And by our God we can run against the troop. By my God I can scale high walls. For the Lord lights up a lamp for me. The Lord, my God, lights my darkness. Hey, words will fail us to accurately describe your greatness. Words will be exhausted. We will exhaust every word that we have to describe how beautiful you are, how kind, how loving, how great, how compassionate you are. So Lord, let every word of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing unto you this morning, this afternoon, whatever times of your people are watching from. Speak to us, Lord. The word that we need to hear to trigger a season of positive change in our lives. Release a word from your throne. Let it bring us to you. Release a word from your throne and let it reveal you to us. By your hands you will plant us. By your own hands. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, because you always answer our prayers. is with you welcome to welcome to service um i'm super excited uh, it's always a joy to come across your way bringing you the word of god um so good afternoon to everyone watching on youtube if you want to say hello so i can know who's watching and also good afternoon to everyone watching on tiktok the lord is with you and of course, everyone on Instagram, the Lord is watching. Um, the Lord is with you. So, I'm speaking to three different cameras. So, if you see me looking around, it's because we are safe. We are safe. I'm just talking to different cameras. I need healing in my body. Let the hand of God come upon you in the name of Jesus and bring you the healing that you need. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Receive strength now. Receive strength now. By the hand of the Lord. In Jesus name. The Lord is going to heal you. 
it's gonna heal you it's gonna heal you now I'm gonna pray for everybody but if you can just give me if you can give me a few minutes of your time then I'm gonna pray for you I'm gonna pray for you good afternoon to you Jody Chiamaka Aretha and Tandy the Lord is with you all so this morning I want to quickly speak to you for a few minutes about the discipline for stability the discipline for stability and if you was at a breakfast club this morning you heard me saying that God cannot trust a person that is unstable it's not because oh it's God and that's just how God operates you ask yourself the question ask yourself a question imagine if the boss say the transport I, I live in London so we use the London bus a lot okay so imagine that there is a bus by your house and that bus never comes regularly some days you get there the bus comes some days you get there the bus doesn't come some days you get there the bus comes in two minutes some days you go there imagine you stay for 40 minutes no bus now on the day that you want to go for an interview that will change your life can you count on that transport system would you if you count on it wouldn't it be that you are a fool if, if you count on that transport system why because the service is not stable the service is not stable I give you another example I play online games so I play like I play FIFA online and because I play online game it's not just that I must have internet I must have the internet that won't just drop signal because if your internet drops signal whilst you're playing it's automatically automatically you lose 3-0 the computer just automatically it detects whose signal dropped <laughs> And you lose 3 0. Even if you were leading by 6, even if you were flogging that guy you're playing 6 0, if your internet should mess up and it drops and the connection disconnects the match, you lose 3 0. So I remember back in the days, <laughs> I'm talking about, about maybe like 10 years ago now. I remember sometimes we don't have internet, so I'll hotspot my PlayStation with my phone. <laughs> And every match that I play, I don't even expect to win because I never expect the match to finish. So I just play it for, you know, let's just see how long it goes. Sometimes maybe one out of 20 games will finish. That is, so what I've done there is I have begun to find the way to cope with instability. Now, this is what happens to many of us. We, when it comes to the way we serve God, I don't know, maybe it's because of how we were taught to serve God. Most people were not taught that God has expectations. We were just told, come to God, come to God, He will help you, and all of those amazing things. But they are not necessarily true. God does have expectations for our lives. Quality and the standard of life that God expects from us. What He paid for. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? If you buy something online and it says free shipping, okay, free shipping, three to five days. Now, if the thing doesn't come within the time, you can't really complain too much because it's free shipping anyways. But imagine you pray for express service. So you paid 10 pounds for express delivery. And the quality of service that was promised is that your, your goods will be delivered to you at 10 a.m. in the morning. Now, if the good does not come at 10 a.m., I'm going to have a problem with the career company because I paid for premium service. Now, many of us, the way we treat our salvation, and this will help you so that when I begin to pray for you, God will have helped you to adjust certain things in your life 
there, there is a way you can live your life and your, you will frustrate prayer. And there is a way you can live your life and your life will be pro-prayer. Prayer will work for you. And there's a way you can live your life. It's almost as if you are wasting your time even when you try, when you try to pray. So, if you pay for premium service and you don't get a premium service, you're not going to be, you're not going to accept just any kind of service. Now, with God also, when God was going to pay for our freedom from sin, God didn't give some of the nice things he had. God gave the best that he had. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? He gave the best that, that he had. And if I go to buy a car and I pay a million pounds for the car, if I park the car in my driveway, I can point to the car and say, that's my million pounds right there. Because that was how much I exchanged for the value. So you can say, oh, it's a million dollar car or a million pounds car, isn't it? Now, if God, the price he paid for you was Jesus. So you know, God should be able to look at you and say, this is my Jesus value son. Does it make sense to you? God should be able to look at you and say, this is my Jesus. So let's assume that the net worth of God is Jesus. Hmm? The net worth of God is measured in well, it's measured in grace and, and kindness and mercy, but I don't want to go into the currency of measuring God's network. But let's just say, that, but Jesus is full of grace. So it's inside Jesus. So let's imagine that the best that God has in all of God's possession is Jesus. And when it was time for God to save you, he brought the best he had. And he, he sacrificed it. He gave it to get you. So what are you worth? You are worth Jesus. You listening to what I'm saying to you now? If you pay that much to purchase something, if you're going to an expensive restaurant, and this restaurant is so expensive that a, a cup of water, a glass of water is 25,000 pounds for a glass of water, I'm not gonna accept it to be served to me in a dirty mug. No, that's not gonna happen. If they attempt to do that, I will refuse that service. Why? I'm paying so much. So what we do most of the time is we just shove rubbish service down God's throat. So everybody says, oh, we're serving God, we're serving God. We don't even understand the meaning of the word to serve. <laughs> when you're serving someone, you don't give them what you think they should want. If you're serving someone, you don't give them what you guess they might like. That is no service. You give the person what they want. So, the beginning of your service to God is to first understand the standards acceptable by God. That is the beginning of service. If you have never considered that, what you have been doing is you have been joking. Do you understand this? You, you, you. I wanted to say you're a comedian, but that's that would be putting you high. Huh? You are the comedian's joke. <laughs> that's what you've been doing. If you think you've been serving God the way you are, because people have lied to us and say, just come to God as you are. Well, yeah, you can come to him as you are, but understand that God does not expect you to stay as you are. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? The reason why God accepts everybody as they are is because he can change them into what he wants. And God expects that the reason why you came to him is that you realize that something is wrong with you. How you are is not good. And you want to be like him. So you came to him. So he expects you to allow him to transform you. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? I'm going somewhere. God expects you to allow him to transform you. It's like a company that wants to hire you but say, well, you have to go through our training first. If you let us train you, then you can work for us. If you don't let us train you, you can't work for us because you wouldn't know what to do. So I 
see a lot of things going on in Christianity. People just want to exercise privileges that they don't fall in line to fulfill the requirement of getting it. People just think everything is automatic. It is, it is, it is not <laughs> automatic. It is not automatic. What you, your, your kids to your parents, or maybe, you know, you have kids. You love your kids quite all right, isn't it? You, you love your kids, and I hope that you know that you don't love your kids because they are nice, or because they, they do their chores. If that's why you love them, then you've got it upside down. The same thing with people in relationship, a husband and wife. You don't love your wife because she's behaving well. And as a wife, you don't love your husband because he's behaving well. That's not, that's not the basis of love. Because then that is conditional. Because on the day that she doesn't behave well or he doesn't behave well, then you don't love them. So you see, that's, the love. Uh, that's how the world operates love. But Paul said, who can separate us from the love of God? When we go through troubles and trials, doesn't mean he no longer loves us. No, those things don't touch love. Love is God's love. There's nothing you can do to make him love you more. There is nothing you can also do to make God love you less. God can't love you less. God can't love you more. His love is absolute, perfect, complete, once and for all. So God does not treat you based on love. <laughs> God treats you based on behavior. So, isn't it with your kids? So, when your child whom you love misbehave, you smack them to correct them. That smacking is love. <laughs> but you see, you're dealing with behavior. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Uh -huh. So, when you come to God, God has expectation for your life. The expectation is that he expects you to yield to his training. Because that's why he saved you. He saved you to be like Jesus. So that he can point to you and say, this is what I used Jesus to buy. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? He saved you so that he can point to you. Scripture says it. That he may be able to point. Let's look at that. First, uh, Ephesians chapter number one. Uh, well, I didn't plan to read this, but hey, we're here. So let me give you scriptures. Just so that you don't take my words for it. Don't just take my words for it. Oh. So the Bible says in Ephesians chapter number two, from verse number six, it says. He raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Look at it. Look at verse number seven. He says, so God can point to us. Why did he do it? Why did he save us and seat us with Christ? and all of these amazing things that God did. Why did he do it? The reason is so that God can point to us. I hope you're looking at your Bible in case you think I'm making it up. So that God can point to us in all future ages as examples of his incredible wealth of grace and kindness. Did you see this? That if a question was to say, what can God, God's grace even do? What can God's grace, his kindness, what, how can we know the weight, the gravity of what it can do? God says, it's like saying, how much do you even have? It's like saying to a guy, how much do you even have? All this rich, 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 you're saying, how much do you have? Then he now points to his house. And you see his mansion built on the waters <laughs> and you see his cars it is not like the one that you have in your like let's imagine that every single car he, ha he has each of them cost 50 million pounds just imagine and he has like 150 of them so when he says those are my cars 
and you know how much each of them costs, you now say, oh, oh, okay. Now you understand how rich he is. You know you didn't understand before. When he now points and say, that's my yacht over there. Those are my planes over there. Then he begins to mention all of the top businesses in the city and he says, that one is mine. That one is mine. That one is mine. That one is, as he is pointing to the things that he has bought with his resources, you begin to understand and comprehend how rich he is. Now, the wealth of God cannot be measured in the planets to say, look at the planets. You know, we can say those things. Say, wow, God is great. He made the moon. Wow. He made the star. Wow. He made the planets and the galaxies and all of these things. He created the mountains and the seas. As beautiful as those things are, they are nothing compared to man. Nothing in comparison to you. And God says, the reason why I spent this much to purchase you and to redeem you is so that I can brag about you. I can look at you in all of future ages. In all of meaning, when this, even when this world is over, in all of the future ages, God will still be able to be pointed to say, look at, see all these people. This is the, the, the measurement of my, the depth of my wealth. Now, I want you to know, that so imagine that gold is very expensive then you mine gold uh, imagine you mine gold now gold in its crude state is ugly it is is it has no shine no shimmer no shine nothing it's just some shapeless rock that's all it is but when that gold goes through process the process that will make gold pass through fire the fire is uncomfortable but when that gold comes out of the fire in the hand of the goldsmith and the goldsmith begins to shape it into articles all of a sudden the glory of the gold begins to emerge so in in its dirty state unrefined and its shapeless state it, it is that same gold but it, it doesn't have much value yet it is the precious metal gold until something happens to that gold that thing is called process or you can call it discipline gold goes through a process on the other side of the process is the beauty of gold on the other side of the process is the true value of gold. So, what God wanted when he came to save us, we don't look like that when he saved us. Just like what gold can look like, gold doesn't look like that when you buy it. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? And also, even if you pick a rock of gold, you can't tie a rope around the entire around the neck and say, I'm wearing a nice golden necklace. Everybody's going to think you've lost your mind. But you know, if you put that in the hand of a jeweler, they can refine the gold, polish that gold, and begin to make it Cuban link chains and, and begin to make things out of it. Now you can look at the craftsmanship of the jeweler using the gold. Now, all of a sudden, everything that goes into that process increases the value of the gold. Then it is cut into small pieces and linked together. Then you call that a chain. Shaped into something you can put in your hand. Shaped into earrings. Shaped into necklaces. Expensive ones. But that is that same gold that looks so ugly when you took it out. This is what process makes out of it. So, yes, Jesus saved you. Yes, you are the precious child of God. You are the apple of God's eyes. Nobody's arguing with you. It's just that you will never smell the reality of what it feels to be precious in the hand of God. Why? Because you, you, you didn't allow him to make you into what he expected. God has a vision for what your life should be. He had an idea of what he wanted to do with you. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? A 
and let me just tell you, you can't do anything with yourself. You can't do anything meaningful with yourself. So you see, you look at the whole world, the wise people of the world, people who own things, build things, and don't care about God. You look at all the things that they have done, and you might look at it, and your heart might deceive you to say, wow, they've done great things. They've done a lot of things. They will find out when they stand before God. That all those things would have counted for nothing. When you all, when we stand before God, it will count for nothing. It is wasting your time on, and those are the things that made you reject and ignore God's process. That actually makes you valuable. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? Okay, so the way that God makes you into what he wants, it's through a process called discipline. Because where God starts from is from something called separation. Before God can do anything much with you, he must first take you through a process called separation. Are you listening to what I'm saying? So the first thing you want to do to gold, when you, when you mine gold, is you want to separate what is not gold from that gold lump. And the more you are able to separate, the purer the gold is. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? Anything that is not separated from that gold is impurity. It's considered impurity. Do you understand this? So when God saved you, you are like a gold that was mined out of the dirt. You were still dirty because you guys don't understand the meaning of the blood of Jesus washed you. You think now that when you now say the blood of Jesus has washed me, that you are now some spotless... <laughs> well, is that the reality? Is that reality? But the Bible says in the book of John chapter number one, it says Jesus came to the world he made and the world did not recognize it. He came to his people, his people did not, his people did not accept him. I did not accept him. They rejected him. But to those who believed in him, he gave them the right to become the sons of God. So see that becoming is the process. So it means at the time you were saved, you don't look like the son of God yet. You, you don't. We created in his image and in his likeness. You are not like the son of God yet. You know why? Because you're not behaving like Jesus. At the time you're saved, you can't behave like Jesus. You can't be patient like Jesus. You, you don't have it. <laughs> you don't have Jesus' level of patience. You don't have Jesus' level of understanding. You don't have Jesus' level of compassion. You don't have Jesus' level of peace. You, don't, you can't. So the storm came, the disciples were panicking, Jesus was sleeping. See, it showed the difference in the quality of their peace. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? So when you were saved, you were saved crude, crude, crude. You require refining. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? You require refining. It is from the midst of refining that the true glory of you begins to emerge. So the first step of God dealing with you is separation. He first starts to separate certain things from you. Certain things that have found consistency in you. That are inconsistent with the vision of God. Did you hear what I just said now? So you now you you lie you lie every time you are you find yourself in the pickle you just lie and, and you now became very good people now say ah this guy mm. in fact when people want to tell a lie they don't know what to say they will now call you to say give me tell me what to say I mean this kind of situation can you tell me what to do you now say ah let me just give you I'll give you two let me just quickly show you one or two <laughs> you now become the lie coach why because lie had become a stable means of escaping trouble for you. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? So lie has found stability within your vessel. It has become one of the chief, chief equipments that you have. So guys, 
or a girl, you want to fornicate, you say, this guy is so smooth. He's so smooth. Uh -huh. So you now have a particular set of skills <laughs> that grants you access to unholy pleasure. Oh, I used to have those <laughs> skills. Don't, don't say, oh, yeah, so Apostle, you're saying you can curve girls. That's what, no, 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 forget about girls. I'm talking about I was addicted to pornography and masturbation. Huh? I used to set challenge on myself. Where can I not masturbate? I, I, I'll prove to myself that I can No, no, you will, not, you will not know. You will not know. And I thought in myself that I was I was being a smart smooth. Oh, I didn't know I was ruining and destroying the fabric of my of my of myself. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? The devil will deceive you, or just by environment. And exposure, he will put things in your life and he will give them rhythm. He will put, he will create a system of slavery. He will make it a system. Do you understand what I'm saying? He will make it a system. It has rhythm. And when, when you hear this, the first thing your mind goes to is that. It becomes like a rhythm. And all of these things were the things that made you until Jesus came for you. And when Jesus came for you, those things didn't change immediately. The only thing that changed was that your spirit was rebirthed, but your soul was the same. Your body is the same. You still remember all the jargons and nonsense. You still remember them the same. So what God does is he puts you through a process hoping that you would accept it because you can refuse it but if you really choose that God Jesus is your Lord and your Savior the moment you come to him he puts you in the refinery and it turns on the heat men who are made by God are disciplined men and when I say men I'm not talking about gender I'm talking about human beings I'm just speaking to you straight from the heart this afternoon. So let me show you one or two scriptures and I'm going to pray for you. If I don't want to stay too long, I, I just want to say these things to you. And then I'm going to leave it to the Holy Spirit to blow on it. And may the Lord give you more understanding. The Bible says, so the scripture I want to read to you now, 1 Corinthians. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter number nine. In order for God to be able to make anything out of your life, just like in order for the jeweler, huh? the goldsmith, the jeweler that works with gold, in order for them to be able to make gold golden articles that reveals the glory of gold the gold must first go through a process of separation a discipline that creates separation separating from you the things that have become your norm the darkness that you have known when I say darkness, I don't mean that you're practicing witchcraft. When I say darkness, I mean the, the ways of this world that has that has become the that is your your default configuration. That's just how you know how to do things. God must first separate those things from you. Then he can work with what is left. 
So the degree to which you permit and allow and submit yourself to this discipline process is the degree to which you will emerge as the version of yourself that God can use. And since in God's house, there are many vessels, vessels unto honor and vessels unto dishonor. You know, there are doormats where you put all the mud that you got from the rain. Huh? And there is also that nice rug by your bedside that you only want to step on it when you have come out of the shower. Uh -huh. So you know that carpet is not carpet. Carpet is different from carpet. Mm -hmm. So you too, you can, end, you can end up as the doormat or you can become that rug beside the bed. How do I choose? Second Timothy, but when, I don't know if the Lord will allow us to get there, but let's start from here. It is choices that you will make to accept God's discipline. And God disciplines a child that he loves. Um, so, 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. I'm going to start reading from verse number 24. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. I'm going to start reading from verse number 24. It says, Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs? But only one person gets the price. Yeah, so he's trying to use the sport of racing and sprinting to try to give you an understanding. You know, when I saw this, I was very, very surprised. So I was like, oh, so they used to race in that for sports time. You know, we thought that it was a, the sprinting sport is just, they started it <laughs> 20 years ago or 50 years ago. We thought, <laughs> no. Then I, then I tried to imagine sometimes out of just humor. I tried to imagine how people be running in them days. <laughs> Running in their pants, you know, you know, you know those days they just tie like clothes around their crotches. <laughs> that must have been so funny. Do they have tracks as well? I don't even know. Or they just run on the mountain. <laughs> so let's run from the mountain to the valley. <laughs> First to the valley. <laughs> but look, it says here that they run, and there's also price. It was proper in sports because if not, Paul wouldn't have been able to. Use it as an example, it was a thing in their time. That's interesting. I just that's just a fun fact. And boxing. And and, 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 and and boxing. Yeah, he says shadow boxing. Can you imagine? He says shadow boxing. That means there must have been some sort of combat sport. <laughs> boxing. Because Paul used the word shadow boxing. He used the word race, run, price. This is interesting. I'm just saying. So don't be surprised if there are race tracks in heaven. <laughs> yeah. So the Bible says, don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the price. So run to win. Accept nothing less than that's what Paul is saying. Do when you get on this track, and this life is a race. Now, the difference is, on the racetrack, you see nine competitors uh, from different nations. So, running in lane one is Ivana Reed, running for United Kingdom for Team GB. Running in lane two is... Who should I use now? Tandy, running for Zimbabwe. Anyone else? Tell me where you are from. Lane three, Jody, Jody Mingeli, running for Congo. Whatever country you are running for, I mean, you're not running for your country. I'm just using it as an example. So imagine that there are nine lanes and then every single contestant is there running on behalf of their country. Now, their competition is against each other. I want to outrun this person. But you see, the race of life, the race of life, your competition Huh? is you you are running against yourself you are running against yourself the new you 
is running against the old you. And the finish line is Christ. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? Aretha is running for Sierra Leone. Awesome stuff. <laughs> Quit running for Uganda. Awesome stuff. So, the Bible says, run to win. Meaning, accept nothing less than the best. Because if one person will win, the Bible says, run with the mindset that I'm going to be that person that will finish before everybody else. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? Desire to outdo your old self. That's what it means. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? So, you are in competition with your... The new you is in competition with your old you. That's why you are fighting your old habits. <laughs> Isn't it? You used to lie. Now you don't want to lie anymore. So you're running away from the lie. Because when you're sitting running, they're trying to run away from each other, isn't it? That's how you win. It looks as if I'm trying to run away from you. I'm running faster than you so that I can put you behind me. Isn't it? And then when you slow down, what happens? People begin to catch up with you. Uh -huh. So when you slow down in your race, all your old habits begin to catch up with you again. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? So in your race, your old habits never get disqualified from the race. It is running. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? It is running. So that lie you used to tell, that fornication you used to fornicate, that anger that you used to get angry is running. Is running with you. Now, most people don't even know. So, they are running side by side their old self. Are you listening to me? That's why you look at them and you can't even see a sign that that person is a Christian. That goes for many people. And people say, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. You see all these naked girls on the internet and you see scriptures in their bio. Then when you look at the picture she posts and you can literally see her life. I don't want to use other words so that this um what's it called the algorithm does not start bugging this afternoon but you know what i'm talking about then in my head in my mind I, i'm asking which jesus is this person talking about <laughs> it must be there's a, there must be a jesus in zimbabwe that's the jesus this girl is talking about it can't be the same jesus it can't be the same god so the reason why people are like that is because they refuse discipline. So they accept the name of God, but they don't want his nature. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Say I'm a Christian. They want identity with God, but they don't want his life. They refuse discipline. So what happens is they are like a gold who doesn't look like golden article? They're like that unattractive, undesirable golden lump that just came out of the dirt. They refuse for God to separate death from them and they refuse for God to make them. So you see, I said the process of making you valuable as gold is the first one is separation. Then you move to the neck on second phase. The neck on second phase is molding where the person, the jeweler, will shape you into something. Then we can use the clay and the, and, the, and the potter as a very good example for that. So the potter begins to shape the clay into a shape. And the Bible says, can the clay say to the potter, what are you making out of me? Woe to he who strives with his maker. So you, before you came to Christ, you already have a plan of what you want to do. I want to be this. I want to be that. I want to be this. Then when you come into Christ, Christ now says, ah, uh, yeah, in this place, I'm the one who decides what everybody will be. So, I must first separate all of those things that you have built as a system around your life to help you become what you wanted to be. <laughs> you don't even want to hear what Pastor Evana wanted to be. Let's not go there this afternoon. <laughs> For safety and security purposes. But, People, you have desires. And as noble as I want to become a, an accountant, and within the boundaries of God's plan for you, there's no accountancy in your destiny. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a this. And within the will of God for you, those things don't even find expression. At all. 
But because your dad says this is what you should be, your society makes you feel it's prestigious. You saw it on the TV. You saw what, however you arrive at. And the devil is very, very wise in this one. He surrounds you with a world that suggests a personality to you and you accept it and you think that is you. For example, every an average girl likes tall, dark, and handsome. At least African. Let me say African. You say, oh, what kind of guy do you like? You say, I want tall, dark, and handsome. Now, many girls think they like tall, dark, and handsome. But you see, they're not even in contact with themselves. They don't even know what they want. It's just a narrative of their time. And it looks like this is what is generally accepted as a nice looking guy. So everybody just says, I want it to. Every girl just says, I want it to. Meanwhile, so as you now begin to grow, meanwhile in your destiny, God did not assign a tall man to you. You see. But the world has already forced a spectacle on you. So you are, you are looking for a tall guy. Now, the, you see, the issue is every tall guy you will meet is the wrong guy for you. Did you see this? If God has decided that you're going to marry, the guy that God has decided and reserved for you is not a tall person. You know, and the streets and the orientation of your time has sensitized you and convinced you that you like a tall guy. You can almost think that that's what you really like, but no, that's what has been forced. You have been indoctrinated and adoptated to like that. And that's what you keep looking for all your life. So much that even when you pray, Lord, Lord, you come out of that prayer place and you still go and start looking for a tall guy. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Now, answer yourself, where is that quest going to lead to? It's going to lead to frustration lack of fulfillment so if God wants to help you where God starts from is not oh, where God starts from is he first tries to deconstruct what you have been forced by the enemy to believe about yourself and to also believe about what you should be because God is the one who decides everybody's possibilities do you understand what I'm saying to you so it's like a clay that has been told you must be a flower vase. Flower vase. Flower vase is, is, is nice. Flower vase is nice. So this clay has decided in his heart that if I must be made into something, I must be made into a flower vase. Then he gets into the hand of the potter. And the potter now decides something else to make that is more valuable and more prestigious and more relevant. More relevant. But this clay now will not accept because the clay has been convinced that what to be is flower vase. This is what undisciplined people look like. Now many of us started with the discipline of this world. But you see with God, that discipline of this world is indiscipline. And so Paul says, accept nothing less than the best for you. And that best is not in you. God is the one who knows what is the best for you. And the pathway to becoming that best is God must make you into a version of yourself that can attain that best that God has prepared for you. So, Verse 25, Bible says, all athletes are disciplined in their training. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win the prize. So, what is the discipline? Think about it. The sport is what will choose the discipline. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? The sport is what will choose the discipline. So for, for instance, if you are a sportsman, you're a footballer, huh? the footballing sport will has already sentenced you to a set of training that will be your own discipline. You won't have the same discipline 
set of discipline as a boxer. You may have two similar th things that are similar. For example, footballers jog, boxers jog. So imagine, and this is one of the problems of being indisciplined. So imagine a footballer looking at a boxer and say, wow, the way he's training. And now adopts and copies 100% the, 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 the training of a boxer. It will be ineffective in football because you're not coming to punch anybody here. In fact, what you are not allowed to do in football is punching people. So imagine you now begin to train and, and, you, and you now, your hands are now fast. Your punch, your punch is now so powerful. It is useless in your sport. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? So the purpose that God has for you, it will choose discipline for you. Now, all of us have a corporate destiny in that we're designed to fulfill the mandate of Jesus. That's why we are called members of his body. So that means the person that is actually doing God's will is Jesus. But we are given the privilege to participate and to help Jesus and so that we can receive the same reward as Jesus. Do you understand? So think about it that way. Jesus is the man. And we are members, parts of the body, like hands, fingers, eyes, nose, air. We, we are members of the body of Jesus. And Jesus is the one that really, really will please the Father. And so the degree to which you submit to the authority of Jesus is the degree to which you are helping Jesus. Your rebellion and the refusal for discipline is you are, you are, you are making Jesus' work hard. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? You can either make the work easy for Jesus or hard for Jesus. So, we all, so it means that Jesus' discipline must be your discipline. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? His discipline is your discipline. So the first fundamental discipline that we have is that we must conform to the standard of Jesus. Now within that, depending on the specific assignment that Jesus wants to do using your life, Jesus will now begin to push certain discipline towards you. So for example, if I want to start kicking, doing kickboxing, for instance, uh, then you will now begin to do a lot of leg exercise isn't it leg exercise i don't want to go too much into sport and all of those things but i'm just using those things to try to give you understanding all athletes are disciplined in their training they do it to win a price that will fade away he's talking about the earthly people now that all of those all of those discipline they do it to win a prize if someone wins the best the fastest runner this year next year someone else is going to win it they're going to forget the previous one everybody's focused on the correct one they do it for glories that will fade away but we do it for an eternal prize so i run with purpose in every step Paul says, i run with purpose it means every action every thought every decision i am intentional so it means that if I want to do anything, the first thing I consider is, does this contribute to my discipline? Does this make me more effective with my work? And the thing with your calling and your purpose is, it is not the fun fact about you. It is all that you are. Your calling is your life. Do you understand this? You was made for that calling. And it is within the confines of that calling that your life has meaning. Outside of that, your life is meaningless. It doesn't matter what you do. To God, you are just a meaningless thing. If you are not within the boundaries of what he intended to use your life for, anything you do outside of there is a waste of time, waste of life, waste of space. You will never be able to function in that place without the discipline that God gives. And so Paul says, one of the strategies is, I run. So consciousness. I run. I am intentional. 
in everything that I do, in every step. So when you want to move, the smallest movement you can make is a step. Paul says, as little as a step is, I'm very intentional with my steps. When you want to talk, what is that? What do you consider? Is it because I see this a lot? People speak and they just say, Oh, I'm just expressing myself. When you want to speak, again, these are some of the things that you learn in this world. Is it the expression of yourself you consider first? Or that you consider that your words either create life or death? <laughs> Because if it is the expression, your expression could express death. Are you listening to what I'm saying? I just want to express myself. Would you like Jesus to express himself how he feels about you? <laughs> Would you really want Jesus to really express himself? You just go and hang, you just kill yourself. If Jesus was really to explain, express himself about how hurt he is, about how you treat him. Would and you know you know the person's expression that you never want to find out is the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the most disrespected personality in all of creation. It is how you even say something just told me to go this way. <laughs> we are so we are so unconscious that the way we just reduce him to say, yeah, something just told me. I'll just something, it's not something. Imagine someone refers to you like that. Your pride will not even your pride will not let, let you even take it like that. You say, hey, who is your I'm not your mate? <laughs> if Jesus was to express how he feels, if he just gives you an expression of your one week's appraisal to just say to just express how he feels about how you went through one week. So you see, God doesn't speak to you based on and just express how he feels. No. God is so constructive in what he says that he is more concerned about the end goal of what he wants to achieve by talking much more than to express how he feels. One or two times in scripture, God expressed how he feels and it didn't look nice. <laughs> when the children of Israel were misbehaving, God expressed how he felt to Moses. He says, Moses, I want to kill everybody right now. That, that's actually how I feel. I want to end everything. Forget about all the promise I made to Abraham. Forget about what you promised Abraham. I just, God says how I feel right now. I want to wipe everybody out and start afresh. I'll give you even a better covenant than Abraham. That's what he said to Moses. I'll give you something better. Forget about it. Wait with these guys. Let me kill all of them. And Moses said, God, Abba, please don't do this. <laughs> Don't, don't, don't act your feelings. <laughs> don't, they are your people. Remember, they are your people. Please, repent of your anger. Don't kill them. And God says, okay. And you know what God did? Oh, Lord. He says, Moses, go and see your people. <laughs> he called them Moses' people. He says, Moses, go down the mountain and go and see what your people have done. They have made for themselves another God. You go and see. <laughs> and when Moses came... <laughs> And when Moses now came, Moses got upset and smashed the commandment. I'm trying to show you something. Another time God expressed how he felt. Genesis chapter number 6. He says, I regret to ever make human beings. <laughs> I, I, I regret. It's a regret for me. I'm telling myself, you have to be stupid to have even thought of making these guys. So you see, if God really deals with you by expressing his feelings, no. God deals with you with the end goal of his plan. So the reason why he won't kill you when you deserve killing or when it really feels like <laughs> what you should get is killing is that he would think killing does not bring the glory. So rather it will help to kill rebellion in you. Do you see this? help to kill worldliness and carnality in you. And so David will say to God, he says, if you kill me and I go to the place of the dead, I'm no use to you. But if you keep me alive and you forgive my sins, I'll praise you. He says, and I know you like praise. I'm, no dead man can praise you. Only the living can praise you. So don't treat me according to how you know I deserve. And I know too. 
Show me compassion. And God says, ah, this guy knows how to get me. Okay, allow David, allow him. Why did I say all of these things? I'm trying to call your attention to consciousness in what you do. Do you understand this? You have to be spiritually logical if you want to be disciplined and you want to make progress. You have to be spiritually logical. Every time something happens, ask yourself to what end. Be quick to ask yourself. If you feel like getting angry and your, your mind and everything is telling you, get angry now. Look at what just happened. Be angry. Ask yourself, what exactly will I gain from this if I get angry now? Most of the time, if you think that way, you will become wiser and you will act better. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? You act better. You want to buy something. You know, part of the incons part of the consistency that we have, according to the world, is to just, you want to buy something. Sometimes if you stop to ask yourself, why do I really need this thing? Impossible. And it's called impulsive buying. Why do I need this thing? Why do I need to buy another shoe? If you just think, it's just another shoe. Do I really need another shoe right now? Most of you, your issue of, I don't have money, I don't have money, I don't, I don't have, have money. Wisdom will help you in that place. Discipline. So most of the time, the reason why you don't have money is not because money is not coming into your hands. It's because you are not keeping it. Because as it's coming, it's going. As it's coming, it's going. So it's not like you're not getting money. You're actually getting money. You're just not retaining money. So you see, to solve that is not a binding a demon or a spirit. Is you lack discipline. See, ah, so many things are undone. You lack discipline with your time. Because the people that are doing so much, they get the same 24 hours. So it is, if you just sit down and you become intentional about your time, and you redeem your time, you will find out that you can do more with that time that you had. You don't need more time. You need more discipline with your time. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? And you see with God, until you show discipline, the proof of discipline is good management. Until you show discipline, God can give you, God will not give you what you can't manage. What you manage, it becomes better it increase what you don't manage it becomes bad and you lose and god cannot trust a man who does not through via the pathway of discipline have learned effective management the primary role of man as touching the earth is to manage effectively earth resources so you see the effect of in discipline in the leadership of the world in how they are mismanaging the resources in the world. It is just the trait of the God who is on the inside of them. Satan is, Satan is called the lawless creature. He is a creature of rebellion. He is a creature who has created stability in disorder. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? And so the moment you come to meet Jesus, what Jesus begins to do is he begins to deal with disorderliness in your life. He begins to bring sanity into the space of your life using himself as a yardstick. And he expects you to accept that discipline. So the one thing, first thing you need to know is that Jesus will put you through a discipline scheme that starts with separation. Then it goes into molding, but I cannot even go into molding today. And in the process of that, the first thing that you must make sure that you do is that you are baptized into the consciousness of this is what must happen to me. And it reflects in every step that you take. Paul says, I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. Look at verse number 27. It says, I discipline my body like an athlete. Training need to do what it should. It means naturally your body doesn't want to do what it should. I don't know anybody who has a body that wants to do what it should. You have to, God had made you apart from Adam. If, if you came from that Adam guy, 
You don't have a body that wants to do what it should. Your body wants to do what it shouldn't. Paul says, I discipline my body. Because the headquarter of darkness in you is in the flesh. In the flesh. The part of you that is compatible with the world. The way of the world is the way of the flesh. And it just simply means how to do things, not God's way. That's just the means. So how to do education, not God's way. How to do money, not God's way. How to do dressing, not God's way. Beauty, not God's way. Everything, not God's way. That is what is called carnality, flesh. And your body loves the things that are not God's way. That's why you don't like to cover yourself as a girl. It's not trending. It's not a thing. Covering yourself is not a thing. It's not the way of the flesh. That's why nobody looks at a girl covering herself and say, oh, that's cool. No. They don't, they, you will not get no fire emoji. <laughs> you post the picture of yourself all covered, you won't really get fire emoji like that. If you get, you're getting from people who, most of the time, they are hypocrites because, oh. So don't put it there for the sake of getting fire emoji. Put it there as I'm one of God's representatives trying to change the narrative. Don't, if you're a, a Christian girl and you, and you dress modest and you post a picture, don't post it for the likes. Because you may not get it and you feel depressed like the sons of the devil too. You, you must see yourself. Remember, we are being conscious in every step. Even in the picture you post, your mindset and your expectation must be different. You must be expecting Jesus' expectation. What Jesus said you to do is to be light. Not to get likes and repost and shares. What he expects is that somebody will see you and they will be compelled to copy modesty. That must be your goal. Not how many people liked it. Because most of the time, the people that like it, they, the moment they like you, they like the, the next like. The like is the naked person. They, I'm telling you, most of the people that like, that like that you have become a slave to, the moment someone likes you like this, boom, it likes the naked person next. So you can't really use that life to measure the success of no. So if you are like that, then you're not running with being intentional in your every step. And you're not disciplined. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? In the middle of discipline, you begin to know your true self. Discipline will lead you to your true self. Indiscipline will lead you to identity crisis. You, you will just be trying to fit into everything. Because you are indiscipline. The reason is because when you start the journey of discipline, you are so far from where you are going, there is every tendency for you to not be motivated for the, with the process. For example, if the goal is to be able to do 1,000 push-ups in a go, and you want to start a push-up journey, the first day you do, how many push-ups can you do first day of 10. <laughs> are you sure you can no, do 10? Okay. You can do 10 push-ups. Okay. We're gonna do Pastor Ivana is gonna do push up. <laughs> she will do push up on Wednesday. She will be on the on the altar and she will do push up. She said she can do 10. You better start practicing. <laughs> so imagine if someone says you're going to 1000 by the time you do 10, you say, nah. <laughs> I'm not really sure. I'm not about that life. <laughs> Meanwhile, do you know you have a thousand push-ups on the inside of you? So what is the difference between you that has accepted 10 <laughs> as your, this is me, 10, and the guy that is doing a thousand that was just like you? See, it is discipline. That person didn't do 1,000. They did 10. Then they told themselves, my journey is 1,000 and I'm not going to stop. So they increased to 11. Then they got to 15. Then they got to 20, 30, 50, 100, the same thing, the same push-up. Until now, he can do a thousand push-ups. And you are still at your 10. Because you just lack discipline. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? So if you are an indisciplined person, you will, you will be a mockery to the cross of Jesus. 
If you're someone who doesn't accept discipline, training, restrain, via the midst of pain and difficulty, you, you, you don't like that. You want soft life. You will be far from what Jesus expects from you. It doesn't matter how nice you look or you appear. From compared to the expectation of God, you will be a far cry. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? You'll be a far cry. I remember when I wanted to start praying and stuff, and I wanted to start praying one hour. Well, I saw it in scripture where Jesus said, Couldn't you tarry for one hour? So I put it, I put it to myself, like Jesus was telling me. And I realized that <laughs> I don't even I've never even thought about it. So I thought, oh. Let me start praying at least minimum time. My minimum prayer time should be one hour. Except I'm just praying like, you know, like, I want to bless my food. I'm not going to pray one hour before I eat. <laughs> or I just want to say prayer or something. Or if you say, oh, I'm supposed to pray for me. I'm not going to sit down there praying for you one hour. But, you know, like a proper prayer session, communication between me and God, minimum one hour. So when I wanted to implement that into my spiritual discipline, and I wanted to start, I wanted to do it based on, oh, let me just, let me do it. Uh, because it's a cool thing to do. I failed. Like, I just never can do it. Like, by the time I get to five minutes, I'll just stop. And I always convince myself with, because I run out of things to say. I've said everything. By the time I say, Lord, I thank you for my food, for my drink, for my water, for the air, for the life. Uh, okay. I thank you for everything now. Protect me, bless me, increase me, help me. Help me to fight my temptations. By the time I say everything, I realize that I've, I'm not just, I just—I thought I've said a lot, but I'm, I'm just like four minutes and thirty seconds, and I'm going one hour. So I'm thinking, how am I going to do this? Even my mouth starts feeling sick. You just start feeling like saliva is drying from your mouth. I just feel like, can I do this? I can't do this. And the Holy Spirit said to me, "You know what He said to me? Oh, He said to me, He says you will never, you will never do it." With that mindset that you have. That's what he said to me. He says, you will never do it and I can't help you. He says, with, that, with this one, I can't help you. You can't do it. The Holy Spirit said to me, he says, the quality of what you will get and your journey in prayer for that one hour, that is what I'm going to do that you can't do. But you see, what you can do that I will never do is to make you stay in the prayer, place of prayer for one hour. Holy Spirit said, you have to discipline yourself. So I now said to myself, he told me, he says, you want to you wanna pray for one hour? Set the, set the timer and stay there and die if you have to. <laughs> so I said to myself, okay, I, I choose the time that I was going to pray. I said, I'm going to pray from 3 to 4 p.m. in the afternoon. So I set myself, 3 p.m., I'm going to start. Until it's 4, this prayer is not finished. And, and whatever needs to happen to me today is going to happen. Do you know what happened? I pray for one hour for the first time. Then now did I just pray? Flow? No. There are times when I pray, 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 pray. I don't have what to say anymore. I just stay there. I stay there. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not, what I'm not going to do is say, in hey, Jesus, never prayed. Amen. And walk away. No. We stay here until this one hour. I clocked myself in. And I carried on. And I carried on. And I carried on. And I clocked the four first. It felt like three days. But I clocked the first one hour. And the Holy Spirit now says, Welcome to the one hour league. Now, you are not a one hour man. You have just tried it. I'm not established in that realm yet. I've just tested it. So now, I must do that one hour so much until I can't pray less than one hour. That's when I have established myself in that realm. So the moment I show the discipline and commitment, God now, the Holy Spirit now gave me something called grace. Yeah? Grace, what, does, what it does is it makes things that are tough easier. But you see, grace is not coming until you show commitment, discipline, that you will, that you don't need no grace to set one hour clock. You know that's not spiritual. You set the one hour, you stay there. Say, ah, 
I want to read 10 chapters of the Bible a day. You don't need no. That one is a matter of discipline. To say, oh, I want to read the New Testament. I want to read the New Testament. Since I'm a, I'm a born again Christian, I want to read the New Testament. And I want to set myself a target of five chapters a day. There's, there's no spirituality in that one. That one is basic elementary discipline. And whilst I'm doing it, I'm not going to check, no text, no call, no. See, that's another layer of discipline. Because you can start five chapters a day, and in between, you 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 forget you you are on Instagram. And then you remember, like, oh, I was reading the Bible. So you put it down. You come back again. Well, TikTok, you go again. See? So you started doing the reading, but you won't get much out of the reading because you are not showing respect for it as the word of God. Then you now have to increase and move your discipline to another layer. No phones. See, that one, there's no, there's no grace for, it is a discipline thing. It's not a spiritual thing. There are other disciplines where you now enter, where you have overcome all of this. There are other disciplines of now disciplining your mind because your mind wants to go to Czechoslovakia and go to Romania and come back. You, you, to now, that's another level of discipline. Let's not even talk about, let's not talk about those ones until you have mastered the basic discipline of set a time and even keep to it in the first place. Then don't don't finish before the time. You, you stay there. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? We quickly excuse ourselves from things. It was ah, we try. We're not gonna. You will never get there. Don't 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 say that nonsense. Of, oh, we'll get there one day. You you're not gonna get there. That day will never come. Because those days don't come. You walk and run and and move to that day. Every child of God was born with the ability to amount to their highest spiritual potential. Nobody is special. Every child of God is given a level playing field. We all have the same Jesus, have the same word of God, have the same Holy Ghost. What you do with the Holy Spirit, your discipline with the Holy Spirit is what accounts for your, out, your output and your, and your results. And so Jesus didn't call us to a soft life. He called us to a life of discipline, dedication, and commitment until we become what he imagined of us. And it's at that level that will become useful to him. Until then, we are useless. I don't care how nice your dress is. I don't care how nice your suit, your clothes, your shoe. I don't care how you can put them together. It's a waste of time. I don't care how nice you can speak and how articulate you are. Your oratory skills, excuse, and your presenter. I don't care how good you are at business. You are, it's just another thing that will be counted for nothing before the Lord. Discipline. Now, I've not started talking about discipline of consistency with interpretations of spiritual things. We're not even talking about those are like higher levels of discipline. We're talking about the discipline of turning up. The rudiments of stability. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? The rudiments of stability. <sighs> Let me show you one last scripture and I'm going to close. This scripture is one of the Live Spring Assembly scripture. Um, and you already know my take on these things. Uh, okay, I have two in my head now, but I must choose one. I can't do two. One. Which one should I choose? Which one should I choose? Let's do this one. Let's do let's do Philippians. Let's do Philippians. So Philippians chapter number one. Philippians chapter number one. Philippians chapter number one. Do you have it? 
I'm going to start from verse number three. I'm just going to jump to verse of interest just to paint a picture and make it make sense to you. Philippians chapter number one, verse number three. It says, every time I think of you, this is Paul, Paul speaking. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to God. Whenever I pray, I make requests for all of you with joy. And verse number six, I jump to verse, verse number six. It says, and I am certain that God who began the good work in you. So there is a place where God began good work. It says, God who began the good work within you will continue his work. God started a work. God intends to continue, but your cooperation will determine the, <laughs> the continuity. If we will continue, how we will continue, how long we will continue for? Discipline. I'm certain God who began good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished. On the day when Christ Jesus returns. So you see that you're not really, I always tell you guys, you are being saved. God is, is working on you. And you participate in that work. Your primary work is yielding, accepting the yoke. You don't make the yoke, you accept the yoke. Let me jump to verse number nine. He says, I pray that your love will overflow more and more and you will keep growing in knowledge and understanding. You keep growing in knowledge and understanding. But the problem is that you, are, you already had a prior knowledge and a prior understanding according to this world. So in order to grow in God's knowledge and understanding, God, you have to allow God to demolish the knowledge and understandings that you have according to this world. The how-tos of this world. How to do this. How to do that. How to do this. How to do that. You have to lay them down. And let them be replaced by God's own how to do things. Look at what verse number 10. And I want to. this is where I'm going to stop. It says, I want you to understand what really matters. So it means not everything matters. And the ability to be able to filter between things. And know what matters is what will hasten your journey to mastery because it helps you to focus your energy like i said this morning and helps you to cut out the things that don't need your strength so that you don't waste your strength but you see the devil he will bring everything to you and it will make you feel like you should do them say but we have to do this we have to dress up we have to look nice we have to buy food we have to do this we have to have that we have to go for this we have to go for that we have to and you that's how you deplete all your energy so the things that really matter, you don't have no energy for them. And so you never become a master. Paul says, I want you to understand, meaning be established on what really matters. I want you to have stability so that you may live a pure and blameless life. Do you see this? You can't live a pure and blameless life until your system of living becomes a stable process. So you see, in a manufacturing plant, they are more interested in the process because if we get the process right, the quality of the product will always be consistent. So if you see a thousand cans of Coca-Cola, they look the same, taste the same. You can't say, no, give me that can, and that can will be sweeter than that can. No. They, they, they taste the same. Why? Because a rigorous process of recipe creation and production process was engaged to put in place a system that if you operate that system, it will produce the same kind of coke. Are you listening to me? So in order for the output of your life to be consistent with purity and blamelessness, there has to be a system rigorously put together by discipline. That guarantees consistency of an output of a certain quality. Did you hear what I said now? A 
and Paul went ahead to say that so, some people, the way they live their life, it's it's as good as saying they don't even know God at all. Verse number 12 or chapter number 2. Paul says, Dear friends, you always followed my instruction when I was with you. And now that I'm away, it is even more important. Discipline. Did you see that? When someone is with you, there's tendency that you will do what is right because they are there. But when they're not there, discipline. Paul says, Work hard to show the result of your salvation. Discipline. Work hard in your prayer. Did you see this? Work hard at your word study and your giving yourself to explanations that bring understanding. Applying a humble heart and a meek heart to be able to understand the word of God because it takes meekness and humility to understand the word of God. Because the arrogant, default arrogant nature in men is that when you are seeing the word of God, you just quickly interpret it and you think you know what it means. And so Holy Ghost will keep his own meaning since you already know. And most of the time, your own meaning is going to be the logical meaning. Just what it just, what just meets your mind straight away as you read it. If it were that easy to understand scriptures, God wouldn't choose people and dedicate their lives to just teaching the scripture. If everybody can understand it, why do people need to be taught what everybody can understand? Why do you have to go to school? Because you need teaching. If every child that is born can just know everything they need to know, then there will be no need for school. So if God created the teaching ministry, it means that people don't just know, they can't just know stuff. People are given special abilities to reveal the word of God because the word of God must be revealed. Paul says, work hard to show the result of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. Look at what he says now, verse number 13. God is working in you. Uh -uh. But you said I should work hard. No, you said God is working. So who really is working? Both you and God is working. So what is God's work? The making. What is your work? The accepting. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? So they say you can force the horse to the water, but you can't force the horse to drink the water. So the job of the horse owner is to lead the horse to where the water is. So there's water to drink now. But you see, you can't drink the water for the horse. The horse has to drink the water. Now the horse is hydrated and has water. You work hard to show the result. If you don't work hard, the result of your salvation will never show. So you will see, that's why you see a Christian, she's still cursing. You see a Christian, he's still dodgy and crooked. The result of his salvation is not showing. Because he's not putting in the work. He's not working hard. They're just sitting down there and saying, well, Jesus will do it. Really? Really? Work hard to show the result of your salvation. Obeying God. Obeying God. Can you see your work? Can you see your work? Obeying God. Obeying God with deep reverence. That deep reverence there, it, it puts quality there. So obeying God is what to do. Then it puts a standard. Just You can't just go and operate obedience how you like. The one with deep reverence. That's the word that is acceptable. Obeying God with deep reverence. That's your work. That, and what does God do? He commands you. He instructs you. You accept it. As a standard. And you begin to work at it. Thou shalt not lie. Then you will not take that. You accept that not lying is good. Not lying is good. Even though the lie will let people leave me alone. No. Not lying is good. If I tell the truth, I'll be in trouble. The trouble is good for me. <laughs> I'll tell the truth and go into trouble. Like Joseph, I would rather go to prison than do this 
and sin against God. So you accept that. That's your work. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Whilst God is working out how to get to the throne, you will be working out saying no to Potiphar's wife. Let me say that again. Whilst God, Joseph, whilst God is working out, because the dream that Pharaoh will have, Joseph could never make all of those things happen. And all the things that will lead to the throne, he couldn't make it happen. So whilst God is working out the fulfillment of the promises he gave to you, you will be working on dealing with resisting this world and saying no to the ways of the enemy. Work hard to show. This is what shows that you are a child of God. For God is working in you. Giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. But you see, God can give you the power and you will not use it. There's one of the things I close my Bible now, I'm done. It's one of the things I realized in my journey with God. Nobody taught me this one. I figured it out by myself. Inside practicing discipline, I began to realize because I used to think, you know, in my head, the way I think prayer I, 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 I gets answered is I pray and God just does whatever I pray. So if you say, maybe you say, God heal me, then God now, the pain is gone. Say, say, oh my God, the pain in my the pain in my shoulder is gone. God has healed it. So I now think that's how God answers prayer. That's the default way God answers prayer. So when I now begin to say, Lord, take away this masturbation. Take away, take away the pornography. Take away the pornography. Then I now thought that the pornography would just vanish. The way, <laughs> the way the pain in the hand vanished. I just thought that I would just wake up the following morning. I would just not know what pornography is. And if you say pornography, I would say, what's that? Is that a biscuit or a chewing gum? I, I thought I would not know what it is anymore. Oh, I knew. I knew better than yesterday. I woke up. <laughs> I woke up and I knew better than yesterday. That's when I knew, okay, there's a problem here now. I don't know what to, what am I going to do? Then the Holy Spirit began to teach me. And he began to say to me that when you pray for a change that must happen in attitude and character, he says, believe that you have received and you will have it. Be what God does is he makes power available for you to deny. That's how God answers. He makes power available for you to deny that thing. It gives you power to say no in a simple way. So if you saw that lie, lie, lie a lot, and you say, Lord, please help me. I don't want to lie anymore. Remove this lie. Then God now gives you. The way he answers is he makes power available. But you say that power, you can't feel it. So you can't feel the power of don't lie. There's nothing like that. God, I have anger issues. Can you please help me? God makes power available for you to say no to anger the next time. Something is going to set you up to get angry. But you can't feel the power of anti-anger. You know, there's nothing like that. So by faith, we believe that we receive. That now, resident in me is the ability to resist anger. So you see, the next time anger comes, you must exercise yourself to that resistance. Then you will now find out that, ah! Oh! I didn't get angry. Oh. God has answered the prayer a long time. But until you exercise it, you will not find out that you are free. So, the way it works is you have been bound for so long. Imagine someone now removes the chain. You will still feel, does it happen to you that if you put your phone in your pocket a lot and your phone is on vibration like mine and your phone, every time it rings, it vibrates in your pocket. Your, the skin around your thigh gets used to the vibration of the phone so much that even when you don't put your phone in your pocket, sometimes you can feel like I see you feel vibration on your thigh. Like, like uh -huh. that's how sin is. It, it stays with you for so long, you are used to the feeling of sin. You are not used to the feeling of freedom from sin. So you don't even know what it feels like to be free from sin. What you are used to, the feeling you are used to is bondage to sin. So when God now gives you the power to be free, the feeling of bondage to sin is still there. But it doesn't mean you are still bound. You will not know that you have been freed until you dare to say no. So imagine there's someone who always says, I'm gonna slap you. And you they, and then they now and then you now say, Oh, oh and then they now slap you. Now imagine that it is a law that if someone says, I'm gonna slap you, and you say you dare not, then they, they will not be able to slap you. But if you don't say anything, then they're gonna slap you. 
So imagine that you now say, oh, who's going to help me? And someone now came and said, the next time someone says they're going to slap you, say, you dare not. Now, you, do, you can't feel the feeling of not being slapped. In fact, what you feel is the fear of being slapped because you have been slapped so many times. So the next time the person comes, you now have the power to stop the affliction, which is act like this. But you see, until you act, you keep receiving the slap. Until you actually now find the courage within you to just say, you dare not. And the person says, oh, shoot, he knows. And he walks away. Then you'll be like, it worked. Oh, it worked. Yeah. The power has been there a long time. You just haven't exercised yourself to it. That's also how God frees you from fear. If you have the fear of things, you have the fear of things. The way that God feels you, frees you, is that he convinces you that thing can't do anything to you because he is there. You know how to exercise that, disrespect that thing that you used to be scared of. The next time it comes, just disrespect it and see what will happen. Guess what will happen? Nothing. That's the day. You are free. But you see, you are not really completely free yet until you repeat that activity of refusing it long enough to until the feeling of being free now becomes your new default. Because the fact that you said one more time, one time, and you didn't get slapped, that one time of not being slapped cannot erase the 500 slaps you have received. Until you keep seeing it, seeing it, and these things, the devil is like a goat. It will keep coming. So until you keep repeating that exercise that frees you, you repeat it long enough until it now creates a pattern of, I can't be slapped. I can't be slapped. I can't be slapped. And you will now start feeling like a person that cannot be slapped. At that point of establishment, that's when you can actually say, I'm free, 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 free. The beginning of your freedom still requires exercise. You exercise until you are now established in the reality of that thing which you have received from God. So discipline is so powerful and the way that bondage works also is via the pathway of discipline. And so I want us to pray this afternoon. The way that Israel was made slave in Egypt is that they assigned taskmasters to discipline them. Isn't it? To make them do something by force repeatedly until they accept in their subconsciousness this is what I'm good for. That's how captivity is formed. Isn't it? If you are put in a jail cell and you can only move from here to here to there to there to there you stay in that confinement until it, it becomes a box in your reality. I can't go past. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? I can't go past. Patterns are formed by repetition. Repetition is very boring, so you need discipline to stay at it. And so I want you all to pray this afternoon. And I want to pray for the sick. I want you to say, Lord, help me. Help me to play my role. You saw that scripture I read to you in Philippians chapter number two. He says, work hard to show the result of your salvation. For God is working in you. Your work makes God's work advance. Your inactivity and your lack of work, it slows the work of God down. Sometimes it brings it to a stop. Now I want you to say, Lord, give me the discipline to do my work. So that I can make way for you to do your work. The glory is, is the glory shines when God works. But God can't work in a person who has not put in the work to accept and make room for God to work. I want you to pray this afternoon, everyone, all over the world, and say, Lord, help me. 
help me to do what I must. Paul says, I discipline myself to do, I discipline my body to do what it must. For I fear that after I preach this gospel to everyone, I myself will be disqualified. Paul says, I fear that I'm not out of the woodwork. So daily, Paul says, I discipline my flesh. First Corinthians chapter number 9. I discipline myself to do what it must. As an athlete, I discipline. KJV says, I do violence to my flesh. I do violence to my flesh. Training it to do what it must. I want you to pray and say, Lord, give me the grace to discipline myself told you many times when it comes to this you will do it Paul says let every man examine himself if he still be in the faith let every man test himself the Bible says and, and Jesus was baptized and came out of the pool of Jordan the Bible says, and the Holy Spirit drove him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The Holy Spirit didn't tell him to fast. Jesus chose the discipline of fasting to prepare him to be able to defeat the tempter. You won't see in the Bible, the Bible says and, Jesus, and the Lord told Jesus take a 40 days fast that thy might be able to confront the tempter. No! He just drove him to the wilderness to be tempted. Jesus was left to take an initiative to engage a spiritual training to prepare him against the temptation. And so in the day of adversity, he did not faint because through discipline, he had built, so he had been, he had been fasting. He had the discipline of fasting. So on the day when destiny calls, I have to defeat this temptation, he, he employed a discipline that he had formed. And he used it to his advantage to defeat the tempter. What disciplines do you have in place in your life that you can count on to say when it matters you know I, 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 I used to say oh God gave me grace to fast but I promise you it's not because I didn't like food because I remember in the time when I wanted to start fasting too, I used to be oh I'll be by that day I'm hungry I'm, I'm hungry like crazy I'm, not, I'm looking at time and saying it's just 9 a.m. I'm hungry and I promise you, I start fasting at 12 midnight. At 11.59, I'm still stuffing stuff into my cheeks. <laughs> and I go to bed straight away. I go to bed. I go to bed straight away. So I don't have to. I go to bed. In my head, I think I'm preserving and prolonging the lifetime, lifespan of the food. 7 a.m. in the morning like this, that hunger comes from nowhere. I say, oh Lord, there's no way I can get to 6 p.m. But you know, I said to myself, I said no. On the days that I'm not fasting, I go without food. How come this thing is that I rather die? So I know that I won't die if I don't eat. So I say to myself, I will not eat because I know I won't die. And so I defeated my belly. I defeated. And when God saw that discipline, He now began to give me grace. Now He now made it easier. Sometimes I see God didn't give me grace. Sometimes I fast three days like this. It feels like I fast 14 days. The fasting takes a toll on me. Discipline! There is nothing you can do in the spirit. It has a physical... You know, it is a supernatural life. God supplies the super. You supply the natural. It's a supernatural. Without the natural, there can't be a supernatural. And in order for your the natural is in discipline. The Bible says the flesh is lost after the spirit. A carnal mind has never submitted to God. It says, and it never will. It has no plan. You must discipline your flesh. Your body doesn't want to fast. You will know on the day that they declare a fast, and you, you will see how you will start getting hungry very early. Meanwhile, on the day that there's no fast, your body just allows you, it leaves you alone. You even forget you haven't eaten. You say, Oh my god, I've actually not have I've actually not had breakfast and lunch you know but let us declare fast and see if you feel the same way to discipline Lord give me the grace to discipline myself to do what it must Pastor Vanna always says God is not going to delete your playlist for you 
God will not clear your browser history. You will go and do it yourself. That's part of the discipline. You will actually go and you will clear your browser history. You will go and delete all of those secular songs. And say, I just say, help me to relax. Okay, you're not ready for freedom. You will delete it. The Holy Ghost, you will not wake up one day and your iTunes is wiped. No. No. The songs will be there. They will be there. You must clear it. Lord, give me the discipline to do what I must. Give me to, to, to give me the discipline. That I may build stability in righteousness. So that I may be ready for the maker to make. You know the discipline is not even what makes you. It prepares you for the making. The discipline prepares you for the making. You accept separation. Bible says remove impurity from the silver. Then the silver smith is ready to work. Remove impurity from the silver. The silver smith is ready to work. Remove wicked people from around the king. Then the king will decree just justice. The king must be brave enough to send certain people away from around him. If not, he will never be able to decree justice because they will keep advising him as a king. You know, don't do that. You must take all of those people away so that he can decree right justice. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Now let me pray for you. The Bible says in the book of Agai, when the Lord commanded the people to build his house, and they accepted and they said, yes, Lord, and they began to work on the house. Then the Lord came to them and said, now you have begun to work on my house. The Lord says, you have not planted anything. So you can't even harvest because you have not planted nothing. You have not worked. You have not done anything. But because you have accepted to build my house, I told you to do it and you accept it and you begin to walk towards it. The Lord says, I will bless you for that. And so I want to pray for a blessing upon your life. If you have heard the word that I've preached this afternoon and you decide in your heart and say, I will take actions because of these words. Then I pray for you. Let the Lord bless you. With the blessing with which he blesses people who accept his demands. There is a blessing for when people just accept God's demand. Now God says, this is what I want. And you say, yes, Lord. I accept it. There is a blessing for that. I command that blessing upon you now. In the name of Jesus. All of you who have heard. How that discipline is requisite to make it. How that you are only useful to God to the degree to which God makes you. And God cannot make you until you accept discipline into your vessel. And you hear this word and you say, I will be disciplined. I will work so that God can also do his work. I pray for every single one of you. May God give you the grace to actually do it. In the name of Jesus. May God bring new things into your life. That will prove to people that you have been obedient to God. May God reward your obedience. May he reward the humility of your heart. The meekness with which you have accepted his word. And by his grace, may God sponsor your decision to obey. In the name of Jesus. May he reward you with health in your bodies. All those who are sick. In the name of Jesus, may he reward you with provision, supply financially. May he reward you with peace of heart and mind. In the name of Jesus, may the Lord increase you. Increase you, increase you. May he increase the fruits of your labor. May the Lord bless you in ways that you cannot bless yourself. Some of you, God will reward you with deliverance. The Lord will set you free from captivity. In the name of Jesus. 
in the name of Jesus. And you will fulfill the purposes of God for your life. Thank you, Lord, because you always answer our prayers. In Jesus' most precious name, we pray. Amen and amen and amen and amen. I love you guys so much. I hope you have been blessed. I hope you have been blessed. Now go into this new week and begin to lay the foundations of the requisite discipline for your making. Do you understand this? Make a conscious decision to say, ah, I want to attend to the matter of my prayer life. I will set a time and I will turn up and I will put frequency, consistency into it. You must make up your mind. Make up your mind. I want to start fasting. I want to try one day a week and I will fast. Begin to intentionally listen to me. This is what separates people from people. What you put into God is what you're going to get out of it. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Make up your mind and say, I want to practice discipline with my mouth. I want to practice the art of shutting up. You know, shut up. Shut up is a discipline. That I don't have to respond to everything. That people can talk and I can just say, so what do you say? I have nothing to say. Discipline. Discipline. Many of you, some of you, discipline is you stay at home more. You are always roaming the streets. You are all over the place. Stay in your house. Stay at home. Stay. Stay. Just stay. Many of you, you don't know how to be by yourself. That's your problem. That's why, so you are, you feel like you always have to be with people, so you are always with people who are draining and ruining your life. Receive deliverance today. In the name of Jesus. Tell yourself, I'm going to discipline my mind. This week, I am going to challenge every thought that enters my mind with scriptures. And I will tell myself, if I can't find a scripture, I can't go ahead and think that thought. It's discipline. Okay, thought wants to take you on a journey. Scratch yourself quickly and say, Scripture. If there's a, if there's no scripture, I'm not thinking it. Last time I checked, I was whatever is good, pleasant, of good report. Think about these things. Think about these things. I'm not gonna gossip this week. I'll discipline myself for it. Discipline. As you begin to put in the discipline, God will release the grace. He will bring the supernatural to partner with the natural that you have submitted. And you start seeing supernatural results in your life. This is how your life changes. I love you guys so much. I'll see you at the breakfast club tomorrow morning as we carry on our um, prayer discipline. <laughs> We'll continue again tomorrow morning. We keep praying. I've told you, you will pray for one month straight. And then you can now say to yourself too, that I've prayed daily, every morning for one month. You see, the discipline is in your hand now to decide, say, I'm going to turn up every day. I don't care. If I die in the breakfast, let me go and die there, I'll go. I will wake up and I will come for that 6 a.m. prayer. I will wake up and I will not miss one day. I remember when we started breakfast club, when we did the first day, second and third day, <laughs> I said to myself, I said, nah, uh, no. A man told me, he says, reduce to five days, reduce to five days. <laughs> or three days a week. It's okay. You are praying three days a week. It's better than nothing. <laughs> but the Lord says breakfast club is every day. I promise you, in the first one week, I asked myself, I, I say it is not sustainable. I, I can't do this every day. It's not going to happen. You know what has happened now? I cannot not do breakfast club. Even when I'm traveling and I'm on the flight, I, I just feel like something is wrong. Then I only ask myself, what is wrong? Something is wrong. And I say, oh, it's breakfast club time. That's why. 
it's funny how things that looks unachievable becomes your default when you discipline yourself. I just discipline myself. When it's breakfast food, I have to go up to go do it. I promise you, I'm not an early morning person. But because of Breakfast Club now, I am an early morning person. I wake up. It's deliverance. <laughs> Breakfast Club delivered me from not being the early morning person. That's what discipline can do. I love you guys so much. I'll see you. God bless you. Have an amazing Sunday. Is there anything? Oh, so today is the final day of our giving. So, yeah, I pray for all of the givers. We have prayed for you already in the leaders' prayers. But I pray for you. May the Lord's hand rest upon you. Everyone, this is what God said. He says, everyone who gives and sacrifices to the growth of what God is doing, God says he will personally see to the growth of your life. And so I pray that prayer for you. As you give and your contribution contributes to the further propagation of the gospel of Jesus, may God make it his personal project to see to the progress of your life. In the name of Jesus, may God give you anything that money can buy. May God give you things that money cannot buy. In the name of Jesus, and may he increase your resources so that you can even be more generous. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So that's us done for giving until the first week of May again. Now, however, if you still want to give, you can go ahead and give. The same grace will rest upon it. We just wouldn't talk about giving anymore until the first week of May. Um, is there anything else that I'm supposed to talk about? Okay, so if there's any other information, pass it, I will pass it across in the relevant channels. Until then, enjoy the rest of your evening. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow morning. God bless you all. God bless you all. God bless you all. Jeez. God bless you guys. You deserve.